Okay. Good evening, respected seniors and dear colleagues. So we would like to start the scientific program today, and I would like to uh, invite uh, Jashi Sood ma'am uh, to give the welcome speech. Ma'am is president ICA and chairperson Institute of Anesthesiology, Pain and Peri Perioperative Medicine at uh, Gangaram Hospital. And she's also honorary secretary, board of management and member of Gangaram Trust Society. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you, Ishtiak, <clears throat> for those kind words. Uh, good evening, dear faculty and the students who are attending this webinar. I'd like to welcome all of you for the 169th webinar being conducted by the Indian College of Anesthesiologists. It's so exciting to know that uh, in a couple of weeks, we will be completing two centuries nonstop, which is really a very commendable job. Uh, for, the, for all the audience to know, we are going to be holding the fourth, fourth international and 14th national conference of the ICA, which is the ICA Con 2023 at the Narayan Health City in Bangalore, Karnataka. The theme is safety in anesthesia and critical care. This program has been very well thought of. Uh, the residence, which they say is, of course, for all the people who are registering for it, is Sai Vishram Business Hotel in Bangalore. So you can all note this website and go down and book your hotel for the conference. Coming to the conference by itself, the organizing chairman is Dr. Kanchi, who is the HOD in the Department of uh, Anesthesia at Narayan Vidyalaya, and it's got a very elaborate executive committee and a, a treasurer and a scientific committee. I must say that it's a very strong scientific committee, which has really um, uh, carved out a very good scientific program. The program is starts from the 2nd of uh, October uh, of November. Please note that 2nd of November till the 5th of November. 2nd November, of course, always is the first day, which is all the workshops. The second day will go on to the scientific programs. This is a huge, um, uh, this thing's, um, we, we can say, array of all the workshops in different areas, which will be very, very interesting and very educative. On the second day, of course, we since we have collaboration with the ASC and the SAMBA, we're going to have a session of the SAMBA session in the morning, morning, and then also a session of ASA later on in the day. We have three orations, which will be done one on each day. On the third day, of course, there'll be topics like critical care and basic anesthesia and postgraduate mentoring, which is a very important aspect of the students who are um, accomplishing their post-graduation. And we also have our fellowship, that is a FICA fellowship, that will be uh, given to those who have applied and who are really fit for it. So once again, welcome you all to the ICACON 2023 and looking forward to seeing you all in Bangalore. Coming to that, uh, okay, just to add on the last day of submission for the papers and uh, pub, uh, the posters and papers is coming very, very near. It's hardly uh, four days now from now. So 15th October is the last date. Please do register and send your posters and papers on the website as shown here. So coming today to the topic, which is the 169th webinar. Today we have a very, very new and something absolutely new now topic for the day. And this is called as newer monitoring modalities which is really new. The modalities are really new, unheard of. For this, we have a very, very spectacular and very, very um, vibrant moderator, Dr. Bharti Vadwa. And she has her, um, her um, we can say the stars of her department from Maulana Zahid Medical College. For you to know who Dr. Bharti is, which many of you, of course, know her very well, She's a director professor in the Department of Anesthesiology, Maulana Nazad Medical College. And as you can see, she has innumerable achievements and very, very important positions that she is holding. And it is very important that she has organized several conferences and she plays a very important role 
India Indian College of Anesthesia in suggesting how we propagate this college. And of course, she is an examiner and a faculty resource. And today I welcome Bharti that please the speakers, of course, she will introduce her faculty, elaborate faculty, and we may start the session. Bharti, please go ahead. Thank you, ma'am, for the kind words. You're always very encouraging to each one of us. And we always pray to God that we always have these blessings and inspirations from you. Uh, good evening, respected seniors, dear colleagues, and all my students. Today, the theme for our webinar is newer monitoring modalities that can change the face of anesthesia. And I have some really brilliant uh, panelists for today's session. To begin with, we will start with, we will talk about the compensatory reserve index, which is a very interesting new physiological parameter, which is based on uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And this helps us to uh, reflect real time uh, changes in intravascular volume and has a potential to serve as a continuous informative metric to provide uh, knowledge and uh, information about acute changes in the central volume status. Uh, for this talk, we have uh, the very brilliant Dr. Nitin Chaudhary, who is the Assistant Professor from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He has many, many achievements in awards to his credit. He has been the recipient of the Dr. Arvind Patel Award in 2014, Padma Kant Award in 2017, as well as 2019, Dr. J. K. Sinai Young Researcher Award in 2017, Promology Virg Award in 2019, Balab Uttarakhand Award in 2019. And he is not only that, he has been a university topper, he is an executive member of iPad Delhi, and he has many, many other honors and achievements to his credit at a very young age. And he shall be talking about the uh, very new compensatory reserve index, its applications in anesthesia practice, and how it came about, and how we can maximally utilize this in anesthesia practice. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nitin Chaudhary, for joining us. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your kind words. Before I begin with my talk, I would like to thank uh, the uh, uh, Jeshri ma'am and uh, Pati ma'am for giving me this wonderful opportunity and all the other uh, dignitaries who are involved in with ICA. It's been a pleasure to be able to be on this platform with uh, such great people. So without wasting much time, I'll be talking about a topic, uh, as ma'am already has introduced, uh, the Compensatory Reserve Index. So Compensatory Reserve Index is a relatively newer thing uh, which has been into existence from over a decade, but there has been very little knowledge about it. Maybe the one reason could be that the device is not available for us to use it. It is only limited to certain countries where people are using it. But uh, having uh, said that, I think it's a very wonderful modality for monitoring the central volume. And uh, I'll be talking about it. How does it go about? So let's begin with the talk. So I bring greetings from my institute, that is All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. So what exactly is a compensatory reserve? Now, compensatory reserve is basically a sum of all the integrated mechanisms of the body that together act to protect against the decreased delivery of oxygen during conditions, whether there is a low circulatory flow or there's a low blood volume. So in any case, if you have a low blood volume or a low cardiac output, in that case, the body has certain mechanisms which comes into action so as to maintain the central volume. Now, they can be of two types. One is the physiological mechanism, such as the baroreceptor reflex and the neuroendocrine activation that we all know of. And the other compensatory responses can also be generated by the body, such as the tachycardia and the vasoconstriction. So they all act basically so that the blood, the uh, intravascular volume is being maintained while you have a decreased intravascular volume. Okay. Now let's see why did we why 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 this compensatory reserve index came into picture. So the very reason was that <clears throat> when a person goes into shock, especially when it comes to the hemorrhagic shock, we rely on the vital parameters. Now vital parameters do not get affected till the time it is too late for us to uh, 
uh, actually come up with some action, some plan of action. So this was one thing that really instigated the researchers to come up with something called as the compensatory reserve index, where they talked about the compensatory reserve. Now, as you can see, heart rate comes, you know, like the tachycardia sets in in later stage, like when you have almost a second severity shock and the systolic blood pressure, which we majority of the time rely upon, it comes during the early third stage of shock. Now, this is the time when the patient has decompensated. Now, the picture becomes when the patient is acidotic, there is uh, hemodynamic, uh, hemodynamic derangements has set in, they can be ischemic injury, they can be uh, radical injuries to all the, uh, the perfusion of the organ systems has been hampered. And now we have come into action looking at the vital parameters. So this is what was actually a problem for the researchers. And that's why they wanted something that can help us and make us act at the right time before it is too late. Again, now Multinatal were the people along with Covertino who basically worked on this compensatory reserve index. So before that, they actually did a study where they made, they took volunteers and applying a low body negative pressure. What they did was they asked the patients to lie in a cabinet where the below the waist they applied a negative pressure now this negative pressure basically acted as if there is a blood loss so the central volume actually got shifted onto the peripheries and the patient's vitals presented as if the patient is in a state of shock now what you see is despite having a 20 percent loss of the blood volume their vitals do not have any change so this is what was troubling to the people because it is too late when we look at just the vital parameters to act it becomes very late for us so they wanted something that could help us to track, that could help us to observe the central uh, volume throughout the journey. So this is what triggered something called as the uh, compensatory reserve index. Now in the same study, what they did was they asked the, uh, to taking the help of the scientists from the University of Colorado, they devised something called as the compensatory reserve index, which I will be explaining it to you. And based on that, they try to see whether it goes along with the vital parameters. And to their surprise, the compensated reserve index gave an idea much faster than the vital parameters. So this is what triggered, this is what incited them to further go into the research and further find out the various applications of compensated reserve index. Now, what exactly is the compensated reserve index? Before that, let us see what it does. Basically, what it does is it tries to find the, it tries to see the waveform of the pulse. Okay. Initially, when the patient is normal volumic, you have got two waves that are seen. One is the ejected wave because of the blood volume that is ejected by the heart. So that is called the ejected wave. And the second is the reflected wave. Now, the reflected wave is what the vasculature, the peripheral vasculature will reflect back, the bounce back. So that is called the ejected wave. So normally what happens is these two waves overlap. So you just see a notch, right? Now what happens is as the patient tends to lose more and more blood and becomes hypervolemic, these two waves try start getting segregated and they become two individual waves, wherein the ejected wave has a higher peak compared to the reflected wave. So what they did was they tried to gather the information. They tried to gather the information about these different morphologies of the arterial waveforms and inculcate it into an AI program. Okay, so they did around, they took around more than 260 normal volunteers between the age of 18 to 65, wherein they took the arterial waveforms of these patients. Now, again, using the same, as I talked about previously, the lower body negative pressure, they did the same thing in these patients and they tried to assimilate more and more and more data about the different forms of the arterial waveforms that got generated as the volume was getting depleted. And that's why they got a whole bank of different arterial waveforms. They inculcated it with the help of an AI algorithm. And what this, now what this device does is, it is like a pulse oximeter. It is just a probe that is placed on the peripheral uh, uh, organ, maybe on a fingertip or, a, or on a toe. And what you see is it sees, it analyzes the waveform that is there in the patient. And depending upon its knowledge of what this morphology of the waveform could resemble, it generates the cardi, uh, the compensatory reserve index. So this is how it basically acts. Now, the 
compensatory reserve index has a value ranging from zero to one, where we talk about one is 100% compensation. That means the patient is normal volumic, the compensation state is absolutely fine, there is no blood loss, and your central compartment is completely full. Now, when it comes down to zero, that means your central compartment, the reserve, has exhausted. So now the patient will decompensate. So what I was talking previously, you know, as the third stage of shock, that is when the systolic blood pressure comes down and the heart rate also rises up, that is when the decompensation has started. So your, your compensatory reserve has already exhausted and now the decompensation has set in, which if not acted even at this stage can result in the death of the patient. So this is how the probe looks like, just like a pulse oximeter. And it gives something called as a CRI, which you can see in this monitor as 0.28, right? Now, using the algorithm that this device has, it generates the compensatory reserve index, which is one minus the amount of the blood loss that has already occurred and the amount of the blood loss that would happen, that would be required in case you want to completely decompensate the patient. So this is how this uh, compensatory reserve index is generated. Now, the researchers come, they went ahead, they did a lot of studies, they did a lot of comparison of the various vital parameters and other parameters that are available so as to find the shock when the shock, shock has set in. And even, you know, some of the most uh, valuable indexes that we use, like the shock index, the perfusion index and the pulse pressure index, even they come up very late. Even they are able to detect shock at a very later stage as compared to the compensated reserve index, which was early, which started telling us the information that the patient is going into shock and this time that we should start acting on it was early and it was very specific that we were able to actually find out as to how much reserve has been utilized. Does the patient has any additional reserve? Can we wait and watch? Or is it the time that we should really act upon? Now, the key characteristics of this algorithm are, firstly, that it directly estimates the degree of the hemodynamic decompensation. It is independent of how the tolerant the subject is to the blood loss. That is the first thing. The second thing is it takes 30 heartbeats. So immediately as you put your uh, probe onto the patient, it analyzes the first 30 heartbeats of the patient or the first 30 arterial waveforms of the patient to come out with a CRI for the patient. And thereafter, it gives you beat-to-beat -beat variability. So it is very, very informative. It gives you a beat-to-beat -beat variability. It is not taking too long for you to act. Thirdly, the algorithm does not require a baseline reading as the other parameters may might be requiring. And lastly, it is small, it is portable, it is easy to use, it is easy to comprehend. Even a paramedic can use it while transporting a patient from the site of injury to the hospital or to the nearby tertiary center. And you can very well act during your way if you think that the patient is going under shock and the amount of resuscitation that the paramedics are doing. Even they can have an outlook and to, as to uh, how much they should be going about. Now, the problem with the other parameters or the other methods is they need a baseline reading of normal volumia to assess the volume status. That is one problem with the other uh, methods that we have, like the stroke volume or the cardiac output. The other thing is you cannot assess the closeness to the hemodynamic decomposition because it will just show the, the there is tachycardia. It might just show that there is some amount of hypertension or the BP is coming down. But Till what time? Till what time can we sustain before it goes into a state of decompensation? And how fast will that decompensation occur? So that is not predictable by these methods. And the other thing is that they are large, cumbersome. They require maybe a transducer. They require big monitors. And that may not be possible in all the possible situations that you might be facing. So these are the problems that the other monitors have, unlike the uh, CRI monitor. So let's talk about something called as a delivery of, of oxygen. Now, when you have a normal resting state, okay, so in that case, the oxygen is getting delivered. The amount of oxygen that is required by the cells is being equally, is being uh, given to the patient. Okay, so we owe to here, I'll just uh, get my pointer. I think it is just a second. Yeah. So now here, this is the VO2, which is the oxygen that is being utilized by the cells. Now, DO2 is basically the delivery of oxygen. Now, the yellow area over here tells us the normal state. When there is normal volumia, there is no blood loss. So the amount of oxygen that is required is being delivered and the amount of at, at the same pace. Okay, so we need not worry. So therefore, the oxygen extraction ratio is also normal. 
Okay, now this pink zone that we talk about is now that the hemorrhage has started or the central compartment is getting depleted. So to begin with, you had 100% of the compensatory reserve and it slowly is getting depleted to the point where you would have no reserve, a zero reserve. So what happens here is till that time, till that zero reserve, uh, you know, you reach the point of zero reserve still your uh, oxygen is getting delivered to the tissue. Now, this oxygen that is delivered to the tissue is basically the oxygen that is borrowed from the other places like the oxygen that is dissolved in the tissue, in the plasma, the oxygen that is bound to the myoglobin, to the phosphocreatin. So these all will be extracted. And till the time you have a decomposition, the oxygen will still be taken care by because of the oxygen that is borrowed. But now what happens is your patient has become decompensated. Now the oxygen delivery is not as per the requirement of the body. And what happens is now the, is the point when the anaerobic glycolysis come into picture. So the oxygen requirement comes down because now it is going into anaerobic state. Now your lactate starts rising because anaerobic glycolysis has set in. And again, the oxygen extraction obviously is rising because there is a deficiency of the oxygen and you want to have more and more oxygen However, there is less oxygen that is available as per the requirement. So this is this graph basically depicts you what is the relation that the compensatory reserve has with respect to the. And using this, because there is a linear correlation, we were able to come up with a formula where we can calculate the delivery of oxygen if we know the compensatory. So it, they, they came out to uh, using this calculation, they were able to find out that the DO to the delivery of oxygen, the critical delivery of oxygen value came, comes down to 5.3 ml of oxygen per kilogram per minute. So instead, initially it was 7.3, but they did a research on the baboons on animal study, and they found out that it, it can further come down to something like a value of 5.3 mils of oxygen per kg per minute. So it also gives you an idea about delivery of oxygen, but sometimes that is also important for us. We want to, we are resuscitating the patient, but we also want to know whether we are actually giving the required amount of oxygen to the patient or not. Another thing, very important thing that uh, the compensated reserve index tells us is the compensation. There are two types of patients, basically, if you broadly talk about. One is the good compensator and the other are the poor compensators. We have also seen in the OT at some point of time that we were expecting that the patient will be absolutely fine. However, just with 600 ml of blood loss, the patient started showing signs of shock and there was hypertension. However, we were expecting that maybe the ABL was around 1500 ml. Now, why is this patient going into hypertension? The HP is absolutely fine. The, the there's, there's nothing wrong in the surgical field, maybe because he's a poor compensator. So you can't treat every patient alike. Similarly, you can't uh, treat every patient in terms of their comp in terms of their compensatory reserve. So the compensatory reserve is also variable. It varies from person to person. I may have a compensatory reserve better than someone else of my same age and the same ASA grading. So this actually helps you in the early intervention because you might be suspecting that the patient can handle a blood loss of one liter. However, being a poor compensator, he might actually come into hypertension at an early stage, maybe with 600 ml of blood loss. So again, if you have a cardio, uh, if you have a compensatory reserve index, you can very well act on time and uh, prevent this uh, decompensation from coming into existence. Again, the important thing that with uh, cardiac respiratory, uh, with the uh, compensated reserve index is you can also minimize the amount of transfusion that you're giving. You can go for a goal directed therapy. You know the cardiac, how much is the compensated reserve CRI of this patient, and accordingly, you can transfuse the blood to this patient so that you can minimize the amount of blood products that you're giving to the patient, especially, you know, the with the incidence of trolley and other uh, blood associated uh, issues that we have. So if we have CRI into existence, we know how much blood can be given, how much reserve has been built up with the blood. And accordingly, we can stop at that point of time and then see subsequently whether the patient requires more blood or not. So let us see what are the various clinical applications and where all has this CRI being used so far in the anesthesia and critical care medicine. So now here, this is a study by Johnson et al, where they uh, studied CRI in patients of trauma who had come. They said they, it was a prospective observational study where they observed 89 subjects, okay? And they found that the sensitivity of the CRI with respect to the LSI, that is the 
लाइफ सेविंग इंटरवेंशन सच एज दिन और एनजियोग्राफी फॉर हेमरेज और टूनिंग फॉर एक्सटर्नल हेमरेज वॉज द सेंसिटिविटी वॉज एज हाई एज एटी थ्री परसेंट अनलाइक ट्वेंटी सिक्स परसेंट ओनली सीन विद द हेल्प ऑफ द ट्रेडिशनल वाइटर पैरामीटर सच एज द सिस्टोलिक ब्लड प्रेशर एंड हार्ट रेट दे फोर द सी आर आई डेमोन्स्ट्रेटेड सुपीरियर कैपेसिटी ओवर द सिस्टोलिक ब्लड प्रेशर इन प्रिडिक्टिंग द नीड फॉर अ पोस्ट ट्रोमेटिक हेमरेज इंटरवेंशन in the acute resuscitation phase of injury so as i talked about that it tells you at an early stage when to intervene other was the effect of blood transfusion on the compensatory reserve it was again a prospective trial by benov et al and they what they did was they observed the compensatory reserve index of the patient and they and, and asked and then they transfused the patient now though the compensatory reserve index increased from 0.7 to 0.8 after the transfusion there was no difference seen in the vital parameters so the vital parameters absolutely remain normal so you don't know whether if you have given blood is the blood really acting on the patient is it really building up your reserves or not or is it just going waste so now this car, this cri will help you to know whether you are actually building up your central volume status or not so this study demonstrated that crm is more sensitive to the changes in the blood volume than the traditional vital signs another study was done where cri values were considered for the need of ecmo in a patient of congenital diaphragmatic hernia where they had 26 neonates and out of these eight neonates basically required ecmo now what they saw was when they saw the cri values the patients or the neonates who require ecmo their cri was limited it was low it was 0.06 unlike 0.1 which was seen in those who did not require it so maybe cri can be a helping tool in early initiation of ecmo in such subject of patients now the problem over here is many of you can actually come up with the thing that why a low value of 0.06 and 0.1 0.1 is almost you're going into decompensation the thing is that whatever algorithm or whatever data this algorithm has is basically for the adult patients so to extrapolate it to the pediatric is difficult and it further requires uh, you know more data to be analyzed and therefore maybe a trend can be used in the pediatric patient seeing a baseline value and then going about doing it because we can't really rely on the values for the pediatric subset again here also what they did was they saw the compensated reserve index after the congenital heart surgery in pediatric patients and they found that the patients who had a longer icu stay had apparently lower cri index than those who did not require a longer icu stay so it can be a prognostic marker also and it can also help you to see whether the patient is going in the right direction if your cri is building up post the surgery is that means your heart is functioning perfect baby is going in the right direction your surgeries are going in the right direction the cardiac output perhaps is building up the signs of sepsis are not there so these can actually be a uh, additional tools that you may use in your icu or in your post operative care so as to know the uh, output of the patient or the future directions in which the patient is going now something very important is a severe dengue now we know that in dengue the patient tends to go into recurrent shocks because there is a breach in the uh, epithelium and the fluids tend to go into the interstitial tissue so what they did was they were tracking the compensated reserve index of 103 patients who had dengue and they found out that with every shock uh, incident of shock that the patient had the cri also dipped down so dipping down of the cri with a cut off of 0.4 was taken and they found that at a cut off of 0.4 the patient actually had an incidence of shock in these patients so maybe subsequently it can be used in dengue patients wherein a cri can help you to uh, eliminate the patient going you know the, the incidence of uh, patient going into shock and we can act at a right time before the patient has any shock now this is a very latest and a very important study which came in anesthesia and analgesia in just this year in the august 2023 where they were able to they use this compensated reserve index to detect postpartum hemorrhage in patients undergoing cesarean delivery now what they did was they first of all defined postpartum hemorrhage as a blood loss of anything more than a liter and they found that out of 51 patients 30 patients had pph and the patients who had pph they actually had an average low post delivery cri values okay unlike and however despite having a low cri values there again the mean arterial pressures were not statistically significant so again a point to be raised that the vital parameters are not very reliable and cri can help you to detect these uh, in, you know these patients at an early stage and act accordingly lastly the early identification of sepsis in burn patient was seen with the with the help of cri 
Now, what it found out was that CRI is a novel tool for monitoring hypervolemia. CRI was used to assess the burn patients who transitioned from the non-sepsis to sepsis, and an average CRI decreased to more than 35%. So CRI, again, gives you an early signaling that the patient is going into sepsis, again, because the fluid will go into the interstitial tissue, into your third spaces, and the CRI value will fall. So again, if you are monitoring a patient with CRI, you will get to know whether the fluid compartment is getting uh, is going on the lower side, maybe if not, there's no apparent blood loss, then where exactly? So if there is a fluid which is going into the interstitial tissue. So what are the problems? Now, I've talked so much about CRI that CRI has a lot to do, but there are certain problems with CRI which need to be taken into consideration. First, I talked about was the pediatric database is not included. So you cannot really rely upon the values of CRI for a pediatric patient and you have to extrapolate, or maybe you might have to go for a serial monitoring of CRI in these subjects. Secondly, is a motion artifact as goes with the pulse oximeter. Thirdly, hypothermia or any medication administration which can cause vasodilatation or uh, uh, vasoconstriction might affect your CRI, intoxication, dehydration, and again, pain. Now, with respect to a pain, there is one study on pain which I could find out with respect to CRI. Now, it says that they use CRI in patients who were undergoing labor analgesia, and they found that the CRI value did not differ even when the epidural was not given. Even the, at that point of time when the patient had pain, in different scoring of pain, it did not differ much. And even after giving labor analgesia in the form of epidural anal anal analgesia to these patients, the CRI value, again, did not have a uh, significant difference. So maybe pain may not be a factor to influence CRI. However, we still require more robust studies to come to the conclusion that whether the pain affects CRI or not, but this study particularly says that it does not. So to conclude, I would like to say that CRI is a newer cardiovascular monitoring device, which is non-invasive, which is easy to use, easy to interpret, and can be used by the paramedics, even at the time of transportation of the patients to the ambulance from the site or to the hospital. So it can be very easily used. It is very portable. It has a potential role in the early resuscitation, other than the various aspects that I've talked about in the other, like even in the critical medicine. However, we need more clinical trials to validate the roles in various uh, spheres of anesthesia and critical care. Thank you so much for your patient listening. And uh, you can contact me for any queries regarding the topic. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nitin, for a very comprehensive and a very lucid talk. CRI is an actually a very important uh, tool and I feel that it will have in future very significant role to play in anesthesia. I'm particularly interested in its role in EPH management, and I'm very sure that it will help save many lives. A very good talk by you. Thank you so much. And going from this very exciting uh, tool of CRI, we have some more very interesting monitoring modalities, which can definitely change the face of anesthesia. And those are of nociception monitoring. We have always had so much controversies about the uh, use of opioids, how much to give, so many studies on the genetic predisposition of opioid dependence. And we are very often conflicted as to how much opioids to give, how much analgesia to give, are we underdosing or are we overdosing our patients? So to begin to tell us a brief overview about uh, nociception monitoring, which will help us guide our analgesics, is Dr. Prachi Gaba, who's our next speaker. Dr. Prachi is a senior specialist in the Department of Anesthesiology at Ulana Azad Medical College, New Delhi. She has been the organizing faculty for changing trends in anesthesia, ultrasound guided workshops, as well as ICA Con 21. She has many national and international publications to her credit. She has also contributed chapters in books, and she has been facilitated, uh, felicitated by the uh, Delhi State Assembly for her contribution to COVID as a COVID warrior. Uh, and over to you, Dr. Uh, Prachi, for overview of no deception monitoring. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to. Good evening, everyone. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Jashri, Dr. Sanish, and Dr. Bharti, who have given me the opportunity to talk on nauseception. Nauseception as a concept is not new to us. 
it is what is known as pain in a conscious patient. But we cannot say that pain is equivalent to nociception because as per definition, pain is a conscious perception of pleasant sensory, unpleasant sensory experience from actual or potential tissue injury. The important word out here is conscious. So only a conscious patient can tell us that he or she has a pain. When we have an unconscious patient, pain is not of any use to us. So hence comes the concept of nociception, which is a process of encoding and processing any change in the environment of the patient, internal or external, caused by a noxious stimuli, leading to certain responses. Pain is a part of it. Autonomic and behavioral responses occur, stress responses can be seen and reflex movements can be seen. One of the important thing to understand out here is that nociception can occur without pain. Just a brief overview of the physiology of nociception. Whenever there's a noxious stimuli at the receptor, then the, these uh, stimulation gets converted to electrical activity and passed over through the spinothalamic tract to the thalamus, from there to the various parts of the brain, somatosensory, frontal cortex, the limbic system, the reticular system, the thalamus, the amyg amygdala, and the hypothalamus. And we get all the responses that we have. Under anesthesia, the noxious stimulus is like intubation, skin incision, and other stimuli causes nociception. These lead to changes in autonomic response, and based on these autonomic responses, and as per our knowledge and experience, we administer analgesia to the patient. But these are only subjective variables, and they don't have any validation, standardization, or real-time monitoring. What we are relying on are unreliable surrogate parameters like heart rate, blood pressure, pulse pressure, skin conductance, pupil size, maybe sweating, and tearing. So these traditional indicators we can lead to missing of major events at times. These current traditional methods have their own limitations, like they are subjective. The assessment of pain or nociception vary from healthcare provider to healthcare provider. Thus, we don't know actually what is happening to the patient. They lack precision because the vital, sign uh, vital signs which we are monitoring may be influenced by various factors other than the pain, and they are not specific to the pain. For example, if the patient is losing blood or is dehydrated, we might have tachycardia. And just by saying tachycardia, if we provide the patient with the analgesia, then we will land up in a problem. Similarly, an adult elderly patient who comes to us for surgery, is he's a cardiac patient, will be on cardiac medications like beta blocker and other antihypertensive may not show any changes in the heart rate and uh, blood pressure despite uh, having nociception at that time, and we will fail to give uh, analgesia to these patients, thus leading to delay in the uh, treatment of the pain. As there is no real-time feedback, there is always a delay in providing analgesia to these patients. So what we can say is it is extremely difficult to estimate the level of nociception in anesthetized patient and the lack of accurate nociceptive monitoring may lead to administration of inappropriate doses of analgesia. If there is an inadequate analgesia, the pain may persist and all the problems of pain may be seen. This pain may persist even in the post-op, leading to chronic pain syndromes in some patients. There can be a delayed recovery and a low patient satisfaction. In our overzealousness, if we provide excessive analgesia, then we can lead to nausea, vomiting, respiratory depression, delirium, constipation, opioid-induced hyperalgesia, delayed recovery, and low patient satisfaction. So there are studies why we are talking about nociception there are studies which say that around 75 percent of the patient experience moderate to severe pain immediately after serve 
uh, surgery, which can lead to delay in the patient's discharge, increased post-operative complications, and chronic pain syndrome. So we need to treat nociception, and for that, we need to have a monitoring. A study where a meta-analysis was done by Bame and et al., who performed to, uh, this study to determine the incidence of severity of chronic pain at three and six months, found out that chronic pain rates are approximately 50% at three and six months after thoracotomy. And another study has stated that these thoracic pain responses are because of the nociceptive stimulation. So intraoperative nociception is an important thing and needs to be treated. We all know about the triad of anesthesia, that is hypnosis, analgesia, and muscular relaxation. We monitor hypnosis by EEG or by BIS, and the muscular relaxation can be assessed by neuromuscular uh, monitoring, whereas there has, is a gap in analgesia monitoring till date. So here the nociceptive monitoring meets the challenge and bridges the gaps and completes the monitoring of the triad of anesthesia. With the in, uh, increasing use and popularity of these monitoring system, it has been seen that it helps in providing smoother anesthesia delivery, proper analgesia, improved post-operative outcome and recovery, and thus is cost-effective. A study done by Major et al. has shown that doseceptive guided uh, remifentanil propofol anesthesia versus standard mm -hmm. care, there is 30% less remifentanil consumption. They have in their secondary hour outcome also found out 80% decrease in hypotension. We all know intraoperative hypotension is one of the major cause of postoperative myocardial infarction and renal injuries thus leading to increased mortality and morbidity. So we can out here say that this study validates that the use of this monitor can decrease the post-operative complications. So it should be used. Another similar study has shown that the PTA-guided analgesia during gynecological operations resulted in 25.87% less remedial analgesia. So we, it also shows that the post-operative pain is also affected if an intraoperative uh, monitoring guided analgesia is given. Major et al. did a randomized control trial to find out whether it has any effect on post-operative pain. Though he did not find any difference in fentanyl and morphine consumption during or after the surgery, but there were few important findings. They were 30% improvement in the post-operative pain scores were observed and smaller increase in stress hormones were seen. Thus, this can tell us that we can use this device to guide us for the intraoperative as well as post-operative analgesia, plus it can decrease the post-operative complications. The available devices can be based on the type of monitoring they are doing. There, there are three types of monitoring, CNS-based monitoring. Conox and Entropy are CNS-based monitors. Then there is an ANS-based monitoring, that is autonomic nervous system monitoring, pupillometer, analgesic nociceptive index monitor, surgical pleth index, nociceptive level index, and SYN conductance are few monitors which are based on autonomic nervous system. Then third, not so popular, is the spinal reflex-based monitor, that is nociceptive flexor reflex monitor. Nociceptive level index and surgical pleth index are the objective new monitoring tools which provide real-time data, and they incorporate photoplethysmography, temperature, and other factors to provide us accurate and precise data, and thus we can calibrate analgesia and tailor it to the patient's need. Nauseceptive monitors can be integrated into closed loop system, automated administration, leading to automated administration of pain relief medication, ensuring right dosage at the right time and preventing the human lag time that we have. Some devices identify 
patients which are at higher likelihood of experiencing severe post-operative pain and they can lead to more targeted preemptive analgesia reducing the post-surgical discomfort. This nociceptive monitoring is a ever evolving field and has few important future trends like incorporating artificial intelligence algorithm into the monitors and fine tuning them to provide an uh, analgesia to the patient. With the advent of these monitors, we can also uh, have personalized anesthesia regimens so that we can tailor it to the need, specific needs of the patient. Certain uh, companies are also dwelling into wearable devices which have more of home remedial measures, but they have a, of clinical importance also. So to conclude, nociceptive monitoring has bridged the clinical gap of proper intraoperative monitoring and management. Continuous intraoperative nociceptive monitoring now available among the anesthesiologists can offer personalized analgesia to the patient, tailoring the anesthesia to the need of the patient. This is a significant step forward towards better management of the patient intraoperative pain as well as improving the post-surgical outcome and patient safety. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prachi. That was a very, very well uh, spoken uh, overview and introduction on nociceptive monitoring. It is a very important part of our anesthesia management in day-to-day -day practice. And uh, for our next speaker, we have Dr. Lalit Gupta who will be talking about Conox, that is a, a new device that has come in practice, which we are using in our hospital, in fact, very routinely. Uh, and this device is for not only depth of anesthesia monitoring, but depth of analgesia monitoring. Dr. Lalit Gupta is an associate professor at Mulana Zad Medical College and Lok Naik Hospital. And he is, again, a, one of my very brilliant faculty. He's an editor of chief of the Indian of Clinical Anesthesia. He too has, you know, we have many awardees here today. So he too has many achievements and awards to his credit. He has re received the best research award in science, technology, and management in 2022. He has been offered, uh, he has been honored with the Vishish Chikitsa Ratan Award by DMA, the APJ Abdul Kalam Azad Award for Best Anesthesiologist in 2022. Uh, he has been the roundtable panelist for human development of, after pandemic COVID for the BRICS educational internship program. He has an um, amazing number of publications. He's been on editorial board and reviewer for over 70 national and international journals. He has also authored a, a two books, one on synapses of anesthesia and drugs in anesthesia. And his list is really a, a long list. And as you can all see that he's really a very well celebrated and decorated anesthesiologist. And Dr. Lalit Gupta will be talking about Conox, a very useful device we have been using in our practice and we felt it was very important to introduce this device to our other fellow ICM members and our audience today. So over to you, Dr. Lalit, for a talk on Conox. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, respected dignitaries and my dear friends. Today, we are going to discuss a very important topic in anesthesia, especially with the depth of monitoring. You know, depth of monitoring is a really, really important concept because it saves you from lots of litigations in private practice as well as in the government center. So, American Society of Anesthesiologists defines the depth of anesthesia as a continuum of progressive central nervous system depression and decrease of responsiveness to stimulation. Although the incidence is very less, it is just 0 0.1 to 0.18% in the patient, but the data is very limited. And due to the vast amount of surgery carried out annually worldwide, awareness affects a large number of patients. And you will be surprised to know that it is the biggest cause of litigations in European countries, where the patients sue the anesthetist that they were aware during the surgery and they could hear their talks and they were quite depressed by them. So, uh, uh, sometimes it is asked what will happen if the anesthesia uh, is getting overdosed or the, it is underdosed. Well, the answer is that the devices help us to understand. They help to know the state of the patient and warm against the deficiencies in drug. 
you know both the overdose and underdose are like the two split spectrum they are they need to reach the center where the dose are previous because if the patient is overdosed it can have the respiratory problems apnea meiosis hypothermia nausea vomiting cardiovascular problems with the post operative cognitive disorders and risk of coma and death while under smoking can cause the awareness the sense of pain cardiovascular instability respiratory spasm anxiety uh, there is a high bp and sometimes the uneventful uh, the un unwarranted the response to the stimuli so what are the various methods to know that we are having the this methods for how can we measure the depth of the anesthesia here there are three different types the center cns based the ens based and the spinal reflex based model while well, you know few of them like the entropy the eeg the bis spectrum and the cerebral state monitor and one of the necro trend monitors the conex monitoring also known as the qnox is the newest addition to the list while the ens based are Pulmonary, the analgesia and oxygen index monitor, also known as the AAI monitor, the surgical plaque index, oxygen index, and skin index. While at the spinal level, we have only the oxygen flexor index. So today we are going to discuss this Pulmonary monitor. You know, general anesthesia is a combination of hypnotic, analgesic, and muscle relaxant. And achieving an appropriate balance of these three components is an art. But how to manage them how to give them the equal contribution and what is the best way so conex is the answer it is a non invasive state of our device which combines the hypnotic and analgesic effects during the anesthesia and helps you to know the depth of quality how it works it provides the real time information on the depth of anesthesia by measuring the eeg and emg patterns and calculates two continuous process for the q call and q knock uh it depth measures the depth of the anesthesia based on these continuous parameters and for this it has the ai based algorithm which is derived from the patient data from the previous studies so if you see there are two monitoring but with a single sensor called as the q call and q knock q call is index means conscious it provides the rapid indication of the depth of anesthesia while q knock means noxious it indicates the based on the high and low eeg in order to detect the any change related to the surgical stimulator what are the other parameters that, that can be measured with conex they are the emg as i told you which reflect the amount of the muscular facial activity the bus suppression rate which is a very important parameter because it is characterized by the occurrence of period of bus followed by period of suppression and once the patient is in the quite good depth of anesthesia psr the bus suppression ratio should be zero apart from that there is a signal quality index also known as the sqi index which reflect the incidence of the artifacts and indicates how reliable your measurement from these parameters and from there there is a graphical area where you can see and perhaps the perception of the sensors so what is very important it see this is a portable device it has a battery life of around 2.5 hours the compact can be mounted can be taken with the patient to anywhere and it has a very highly conductive silver impregnated sensor pads which allow the conex sensor to achieve accurate eeg for both q call and q knock so as you can see there are the three electrodes 1 2 and 3 3 is on the temporal 2 and 1 are the frontal area and this part last one part is meets with the sensor uh if you see this is from my ot where i have taken few pictures while i am using the conex first i have put the conex mon q q call conex monitor on it uh, pole in the second if you see the red arrow on the peak i have put the electrodes and in the c you know it is by comprehensive monitoring there i can see all the uh, patterns of the respiration from the patient the ventilation parameters the hemodynamics and there is some reading of 51 and this reading is my depth of lcc activity and from there if you see the larger view it is the pulse 60 when the patient is slightly lower plane and q knocks that is the pain index i will come to the one by one so there is an algorithm how does it calculate i told you the most important thing is the bus suppression ratio so it calculates the how many in there is the abnormal activity and the fast fourier transformation which means there the infinite number of the alpha beta theta gamma and delta waves it uh, it makes them analyze them and makes a quantitative model models which is the ai based model which is based on the previous pk pd values of the uh, assessment of sedation score the ramsey score and the p concentration of the propofol there the consciousness is achieved so the large database is received from the previous steps and the main thing that is in the psr the bus suppression which is the most important uh, parameter 
Similarly, the noxious stimulus, the coupon maintain, it maintains the same model from the PSR and the first Fourier transformation. However, the data is uh, calculated from the noxious stimuli from the LMA insertion, the laryngoscopy, and from the remifentanyl P concentration. So it, it basically analyzes the data which has been calculated from the previous studies, put into a coordinating model, which is an AI model, and gives the coupon and QLOX values. So you know why it is so important. See, QCON, the conscious, the awake and sedation, it corresponds the patient may have the noxious stimuli. When the patient is in the GA, the noxious stimuli should not be present. Deep anesthesia and isoelectric easy means there is a very low probability the noxious stimuli may happen. And the value for this for both is 40 to 60, means the depth of anesthesia is adequate, at which there will be good depth as well as the no noxious stimuli to the patient. So I am showing you a small video where I have tried to focus on the few parameters that are measured by this model. If you see, the first is the loss of consciousness. And for this, we have the SQI monitor, the ENG, PSR, ELOX, and q uh, It measures the impedance of the skin. And from there, it, the next thing it measures is the EMG ratio. The SQI index, that means the artifact. And once it is 100, it means there is no artifact at present. The EMG ratio, it means the no facial activities present. Then it is followed by the PSR. As I told you, it should be typically zero during the period of anesthesia. Finally, the value of the QNOX, which means the patient is not having any pain at present, which was implied within the range of 40 to 60. And the last is the depth of anesthesia, which is around 52 to 42 between 60. It means here in my monitor, it is 53. So this is how a QNOX monitor measures. And you can see in the background, there is the activity, which you can see as the graphical pattern. So this is how it measures the hypnosis as well as the elements. Uh, but you know, for everything, we need some validation because the test medicine says that everything has to be validated. So from where the validation comes? It comes from the data, the smart algorithm, which has been made, the AI algorithm, and the hardware, which is the Conox monitor. Uh, there was a study where the assessment of the GA was uh, from the QNOX index was uh, measured. And for this, uh, this was based on the Cocofall, where they are compared with the uh, objective assessment of alertness as well as the sedations. The findings were said that QCON performed as good as this, the AI index, the P, the P concentration of propofol for predicting the three clinical signs. That is the loss of eye reflex, the reaction to the noxious stimuli, and no movement. While QCON can be used as an accurate indicator for the level of sedation and loss of consciousness during the propofol analysis. So the, all the initial data that we are using is based on the propofol analysis here. And it is from the meta analysis and meta studies which have been calculated. Uh, similarly, for the sedation, the same data has been uh, assessed to compare with the Ramsey sedation score and the bliss values. And from here, it has been found that the burst suppression rate, the QCON index, it has a very high correlation with the bliss index. The ability to predict the change, it was similar for both the QCON and the bliss monitor. The QCON index was able to satisfactorily assess the level of sedation during administration of propofol and remifentanil in patients undergoing the ultrasonography and other procedures. The QCON index is much more stable than this because it is unaffected by the cautery and the scenario and smaller moments which the patient sometimes were produced because of the surgical manipulation. Again, coming to the QCON, the noxious stimuli, how it is reliable for this. Again, the study has been done, and for this, it has been compared with the BIS score. The electrical uh, interference was zero, and they found that nociception activation persists in the brain during the deep GA despite the abolished clinical response. This is the reason why the noxious stimuli should be measured by the patient in the GA. Absent clinical responses are therefore not indicative or absent nociception specific activation. The clinical response might be the inadequate markers to assess the anti nociception during the GA. If you see this chart, the red and yellow part are the noxious stimuli which are shown during the functional MRI when the patient was in the GA. So again, it was to be validated and to validate it again, the patient was taken and both the hypnotic effect as well as the noxious effect of the nociception was, uh, it was assessed with the easy derived indices. For this, they found that for the lower the QNOX value, the higher probability a patient will not move either be the laryngoscopy, the LMA, or the tracheal information. So during the GA, it has been seen that it is a good indicator for any noxious stimuli, and it gives a very accurate reading because the rough is the parabolic where the higher part shows that the 
more the Q naught value, the more is the chances that patient may uh, have the stimulation. So, uh, if you see, there is a wall, a fire line rise in the values of the Q call and Q naught during reduction and recovery. The Q call has the faster decrease in the Q naught after the drug indication means the conscious part is became more more precise than the noxious stimuli. It has a faster increase the Q naught and Q call during the recovery means the patient has feels the noxious action earlier than the consciousness. So it is this is the importance of this monitor. It says the patient may still have the pain before the patient become conscious, and it is the reason the patient may having the higher sympathetic stimulation during the recovery period. Q call and Q naught were able to differentiate. Between the times of action of hypnotic and analgesic agent, and QNOX could be interpreted as an arousability index. Means, when the QCON index, it, it, I told you, it comes earlier than the QCON, QNOX. So, as it comes, you can see the patient is going to get it. Uh, there is a study of the, in the, uh, every people says, the why happen? It happens because in the ICU, there are the many patients. And can you measure it? Yes. A study is done by the AIMS Tokut. They had found that coupon can be used as a assessing sedation level in mechanical ventilator critical ill patient. And the results were more accurate than the this and the RSS value. And they said that they can be implemented in the ICU. Again, what happened during the cardiopulmonary bypass is another period here. The QNOX and coupon index leave high positive correlation with the temperature during the hypothermia. Because during the cardiopulmonary bypass, the patient are kept cold. Even at that time, the QNOX and QCON values were very much reliable and it was better predictor than uh, other type of correlations. Similarly, I would say why I should use the Conex monitor because it reduces the anesthetic dose, it decreases the risk of overdosing and underdosing. And as I told you, QCON is the fastest depth of anesthesia index in the market at present in comparison to base and entropy monitors. The use of QCON may reduce the post op operative requirements. You can assess the, if you have what is the index before the uh, patient becomes conscious. And more important, at present, which I am using it for the nerve blocks. Once you have put the nerve block after the induction of the patient, you can assess the, the noxious stimuli. You can see the, how much effective your nerve block. And that's why it can be incorporated in many of the intergraduate thesis, post graduate thesis. The thinner design plus low weight and this long duration can make it ideal monitor for transferring to the other high risk places. And as I told you, it has only three electrodes. Means it reduces the probability of occurrence of the artifact. And it reduces the risk of sensor coming loose and creating a bleed off situation. That means it is very reliable, very steady monitor and can be used. And another development as you guys must be interesting is the app, the Conex view. It's another app where, which has the same display and save the data from the Conex monitor. It is connected available on the Google Play Store for the Android, but it is still not available for the iPhones. The, the process of iPhone is in the process and it may take some time. Till then, it is connected with the Bluetooth in the Android phone and it application replicates the same data of the phone experiment. With this, I end my, end my talk and I invite you for any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lalit. Uh, really very nice talk. And one realizes that Kunox actually opens up a lot of possibilities for us as anesthesiologists. It's a very simple device for those who've been using it. I think they will fully agree with, uh, with the two of us when we say that it will probably be actually a game changer for nociceptive mon uh, monitoring. Um, and in going in, going along with the theme of nociceptive monitoring, we have another very useful device, which is that of pupillometry. And who could have ever thought that a simple pupillary response, a dilatation of the pupils, the reflex, reflex response could have so much meaning for us anesthesiologists and have so much implications. It started as a very basic clinical science has now evolved into a validated and scientific method for nociception stimulation and for many other useful purposes. And to talk about pupillometry, we have with us Dr. Sukhyanti Kirai. She is an associate professor in the Department of Anesthesiology at Mulana Azad Medical College in Delhi. She is the recipient. Again, she is an awardee. I'm very proud that all my panelists are amazing, not only amazing speakers, but have so much achievements to the credit. Sukhyanti is a very sweet and humble girl, but she is a brilliant academician. She has an innumerable research papers to her credit, 
a very hardworking member of the department. She has received the Bhojraj Award in 2017. And she is the, on the editorial board member of BMC Anesthesiology, as well as the Journal of Indian College of Anesthesiologists, GICA. So Dr. Kyanti will be talking about pupillometry and its uses for us anesthesiologists. Over to you, Dr. Sukhyanti. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for your kind words. Now uh, we move on to the next intraoperative nociceptive monitoring tool that is the pupillometry. As the name suggests, pupillometry is a device that measures the characteristics of the pupil. More importantly, its response to the light and to the noxious stimulus. Now the pupillary dilatation reflex in response to the noxious stimulus has been described around 300 years ago by Philip de la Hire and a German physiologist Maurice Sipes has described this dilatation reflex as an accurate measurement of pain and promoted this reflex as an anesthesiometer. Over the years, pupillary examination has been an integral part of our clinical practice and it is an integral part of assessment of the brain and as well as for the ophthalmologic conditions. Goodell's, while describing the stages of ether, has described the effect on the uh, depth of the anesthesia on the size of the pupil. From the nine, uh, late 1980s, the pupillometry has been available as a handheld device, and since then, there has been gradually but slowly increasing use of pupillometry in anesthesia practice. Now, coming on to the anatomy and physiology of the pupil, pupil we know is a central aperture in the iris of the eyes and its size is determined by the two groups of antagonizing smooth muscles, the circular sphincter pupillae, which has the parasympathetic innervation, and the radially arranged dilator iridis muscles, which are supplied by the sympathetic fibers. Now, whenever any light is uh, presented to the eye, either directly or through the consensually on the other eye, the pupillary light reflex is elicitated. Typically, there is a phase of latency, and followed by the constriction of the pupils. And when there is continuous exposure to the light, there is dilatation, where the pupil again comes back to the normal size and recovery happens. So pupillimetry is a handheld portable device which is used as a surrogate measure to quantify the nociception. And it is useful for those patients who are not able to convey verbally the pain that they are experiencing, such as those who are under a general anesthesia or in the post-operative care unit the patient who are obtained from the residual effects of the anesthesia drugs, as well in certain patients like those who are non-verbal, demented patient, or those who are experiencing delirium. So parts of the pupillometry, typically a pupillometer has a screen for display of the parameters. There is a keyboard or touch screen to enter the data of the patient. There is a light emitting source and an image capture system which detects the reflected infrared light. Now, the pupillary response under general anesthesia is different compared to the awake state. In the awake state, whenever a person enters the dark room, there is a pupillary dilatation mediated by the sympathetic pathway. However, in patient under general anesthesia, the loss of the light does not lead to the pupillary dilatation. Now, why this happens? This happens because of parasympathetic control of the pupil, the involvement of the Edingar Vespal nucleus, which is present in the midbrain. This nucleus is a kind of automatic pacemaker. It means it continues to fire even in the absence of any stimulus which is coming from the retina. Under normal awake condition, this EWS nucleus is under the control of other centers which are present in the midbrain. In the awake state, this center is inhibited by the inhibitory neurons which are activated by the reticular activating system. Under anesthesia, this edinger vespal nucleus is disinhibited because of the effect of the various drugs such as opioid. So because of disinhibition of the edinger vespal nucleus, even in the condition of dark, the pupillary dilatation does not occur in the patient who are under general anesthesia. They have the pupillary constriction. Another important difference in the pupillary response under anesthesia is that in awake individuals, the size of the pupils is decided by the sympathetic and the parasympathetic pathway balance. However, under general anesthesia, the contribution of sympathetic nervous system in the contribution of the pupil size is absent. Now, this appears to be a paradox because the other sympathetic reflexes, such as the cardiovascular reflexes, they are very much activated during the general anesthesia. But the sympathetic pathways, which are involved in the dilatation of the pupils, are not activated. 
it has been speculated this happens because the cardiovascular reflexes are completed within the lower brain stem whereas the sympathetic pathway which dilates the pupils they transverses the pathway above the upper mesen capillon which is inhibited during the general anesthesia yeah. hence the sympathetic does not contribute to pupillary size in the patient who are under general anesthesia now the parameters which are measured by the pupillometer include latency maximum constriction amplitude the pupillary right reflex amplitude constriction and the dilatation velocity so the latency is the duration between the exposure to the light and the beginning of the pupillary constriction maximum maximum pupillary constriction is the difference between the baseline size of the pupil uh, uh, minus the final size of the pupil which is at the uh, peak of the pupillary constriction the pupillary right reflex amplitude is the uh, is the maximum constriction pupil expressed as the percentage of this then we have the average constriction velocity which is the initial pupillary diameter minus the minimum pupillary diameter which is divided by the constriction time similarly during the dilatation phase when there is continuous exposure to the light we can calculate the dilatation velocity so another parameter is the neurological pupillary index which is uh, based on an algorithm that takes all these uh, variables of the pupillary meter as an input and compares it to the normal model and gives a composite score from 0 to 5 the score of 3 to 4.9 is taken as a normal where the pupillary reflex is brisk score less than 3 is taken as an abnormal or the sluggish pupillary index and a score of 0 indicates that the pupil is non reactive or has the atypical response there is another parameter for pupillometry that has been recently described that is the pupillary unrest under ambient light or the variation coefficient of pupillary diameter both of these parameters are based on a physiological phenomena of pupillary unrest or pupus. Under the normal condition, there is a sustained physiological oscillation of around uh, low frequency 0.2 hertz, which varies the diameter of the pupil by 1 to 2 uh, mm. This pupillary unrest can be seen in dark or in the ambient condition. In the dark condition, it is more prominent in drowsy patient and and in awake patient or normal individuals, it is used as a metric for sleep deprivation. It is basically due to inability of the person to maintain the inhibitory control of the Edingar Vespal nucleus. Whereas the pupillary unrest in the ambient condition directly correlates to the intensity of the ambient light. Opioids are known to decrease the pupillary unrest because they inhibit the inhibitory neurons which are controlling the Edingar Vespal nucleus. The pupillary unrest under the ambient light is measured by taking a sample of pupillary dimensions. They do the Fourier analysis and after the removal of the artifact, the area under the curve is calculated as a pupillary unrest under ambient light. Whereas the same phenomena is measured differently when we uh, report this as a variation coefficient of the pupillary diameter. This is calculated by taking a sample of pupillary diameters, then their dispersion from the median is calculated and it is divided by the median. It gives the variation coefficient of the pupillary diameter. So how pupillary uh, parameters are measured? Under anesthesia, very typically a standard cutaneous tetanic pain stimulus of 100 hertz or 40 to 60 milliampere is given for 1 to 2 seconds and simultaneously pupillary measurements are taken. The change in the pupillary reflex diameter by 13 to 25 percent is taken as the significant parameters. Another approach is to calculate the pupillary pain index here, a stepwise increment of 10 milliampere current is given every second starting from the 10 milliampere. This is continued to given until the pupillary reflex diameter amplitude reaches more than 13 percent. The uh, electrical intensity at which this amplitude is reached is taken as the pupillary pain index. Now, pupillary uh, parameters in the perioperative me uh, medicine has been used as an assessment of nociception under general anesthesia for the management of analgesia in the postoperative period. It has also been used to check the extent and adequacy of the regional anesthesia techniques. It has been also used as a predictor of hypotension under spinal and general anesthesia, and it has other uses in the intensive care unit. Now, whenever these uh, pupillometry parameters are used, there are certain factors which are known to affect the pupillary reflexes, like the 
the most important being the resting size of the pupil. There is a large dynamic range in the size of the pupils in individuals. It varies from two to seven millimeters. Ambient light is also known to affect the pupillary constriction. It alters the sensitivity of the retina. So this, uh, the uh, portable pupillometer that we have that uses the infrared light and they are often provided with an opaque cap to cover the measured eye. Also, the various drugs which are used under anesthesia are known to affect the pupillary response. Like the opioid, it causes meiosis. Most of the drugs which are used under anesthesia, they all cause meiosis. But they affect the different parameters of the pupillometry. Like the opioids are known to decrease the pupillary right reflex amplitude, whereas the propofol and barbiturates are known to affect the constriction velocities. The anti drugs like the droperidol and the metaclopramide, they decreases the pupillary reflex amplitude. So the first use of pupillometry is for the intraoperative assess assessment of the nociception. So it, uh, various studies have been done. In one study, pupillometry has been assessed compared to the standard practice of giving the analgesia at the discussion of the anesthetist. So patients were divided into two groups. In one group, the drugs were guided by the pupillometry parameters. The increase in the baseline pupillary diameter by more than 30% were taken as a point at which the analgesic drugs were supplemented, whereas in the other standard group, the drugs were given at the description of the anesthetist. It has been seen that the use of the pupillometry lead to significant decrease in the intraoperative consumption of the remipentanil as well as postoperative consumption of the morphine. In another study, pupillometry is used to another nociceptive monitoring that is the surgical plate index in patients who are undergoing laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So it has been uh, found that compared to surgical plate index, the use of pepidometry lead to significant reduction in the remipentanil consumption. So based on this, these studies, it has been inferred that the pupillometry performs better compared to the other objective parameters of nociception under general anesthesia. It has been speculated that this result is because due to the fact that pupillary dilatation reflex, as we have discussed, it does not depend on the systemic sympathetic activation. So it is not going to influence by the vasodilators or the vasoconstrictor use agents, which are used very commonly under anesthesia or by the circulating catecholamines. Another advantage is that the pupillary dilatation reflex has a lower latency. It responds faster and it returns back relatively faster when the stimulation disappears. However, when it is used intraoperatively for nociception measurement, it has various limitations like that we have discussed. It is affected by the drugs used by the anesthetics. It is influenced by the depth of the anesthesia, also by the ambient light. There are certain practical uh, problems which are also associated with the use of the pupillary medium, like it does not measure the nociception degree continuously. So intermittent and repeated access to the pupil is needed. So sometimes the, uh, the repeated access to the pupil under the surgical drape, drapes can be cumbersome. And also it cannot be used in conditions such as cataract, prosthetic uh, eye or uh, in condition of the ocular injuries. The second use of pupillometry is for the use of the postoperative analgesia. Again, there are uh, many studies that has been done for guiding the analgesic drugs in the postoperative period. It has been inferred that the pupillary diameter has no association to the severity of the early postoperative pain because of the effect of the residual intraoperative opioids and also because the nature of the postoperative pain, unlike the intraoperative noxious stimulus that we use to measure the PRD is different. The, the postoperative pain typically is low intensity and continuous in nature. But recently, uh, the parameter based on the pupillary unrest that we have discussed, variation uh, coefficient of the pupillary diameter has been found to be promising in measurement of analgesic requirement in the postoperative period. It has been found that the area under the curve of variation coefficient of the pupillary unrest has the highest 0.92 compared to pupillary right reflex parameters or the visual analog score. So this variation can be used in the postoperative period for guiding the analgesic drugs. In another study, again, the same parameter by different approach has been calculated, that is the pupillary unrest under ambient light. It has been seen that the opioid, the patient who, uh, who uh, exhibited decreased response to this pupillary unrest they respond poorly to the opioids compared to those who respond 
those who have the higher pupillary unrest. So pupillary unrest under ambient light has more negative prediction compared to the projective predictive value. Another important use of pupillometry in perioperative medicine is its use regarding the regional anesthesia technique. It has been used extensively for measuring the efficacy and extent of the regional blocks and for assessing the adequacy of the liver analgesia. Also, it has been used as a predictor of hypotension following spinal anesthesia. As early as 1994, the first study was done by the Larsen et al, where the patient who are undergoing general anesthesia along with the thoracic epidural has been assessed using the pupillometer. So it has been seen that the pupillometer compared to the pin, pin prick sensation correctly identified the uh, dermatomal uh, blocked by the epidural in 100% of the patient who, and uh, uh, those patients who are undergoing the general anesthesia. In a similar study, uh, it has been seen that the pupillary response more than one millimeter, it predicted the insufficient block in as high as 94.1% of the patient. There are more number of studies which have detected the use of pupillometry in observing the response to the sciatic nerve block as well as to the thoracic paravertebral blocks. In pediatric patients, the pupillometer has been used to assess the adequacy of the caudal block. So it has been found that the pupillometer correctly identified the sensory block in 100% of the patient compared to only 20% of the patient where the sensory block is assessed by the changes in the skin temperature. However, one important point is that the pupil, uh, pupillometry has been found to be useful only in patients who are aging more than two years of the age. More, uh, it, it, it has been attributed to the fact that the pathways which are involved in the pupillary reflex are matured in these group, age group of the patients. There are uh, for predicting the risk of hypotension following spinal anesthesia or general anesthesia. There are only three studies that uh, that are described in the literature. The role of the pupillometry has not been found good in predicting the risk of hypotension. As you can see, the area under the curve for various pupillometry is around 0.5 or 0.6. So the pupillometry is not found to be a very good predictor of hypotension in patients who are undergoing spinal anesthesia or general anesthesia. In patients who are undergoing labor, uh, who are uh, receiving labor uh, analgesia in the form of epidural, it has been found that the variation coefficient of pupillary diameter is a better predictor compared to the self-rated numerical rating score. In patients, of the intensive care unit, pupillometry has been also extensively used. It has been used for prognostication of post-cardiac arrest. It has been seen that the most sensitive and the specific parameters is the zero-hour pupillometry readings that are taken that has a high sensitivity of around uh, 0.8 area under the curve. In the intensive care unit, pupillometry has been also used to predict the risk of intracranial pressure hypertension in the herniation, the various parameters like the constriction velocity, the pupillary size reduction, and the neurological pupillary index have been used for predicting that. Apart from these, in the intensive care unit, it has been also used to guide the pain and adjust the analgesic drugs before performing any painful procedures such as endotracheal tube suctioning or the change of the surgical dressing. In one study, it has been used for detecting the vasospasm in the subarachnoid hemorrhage, which lead to the delayed cerebral ischemia. So to conclude, the pupillometry has a uh, it is a it has a superior role for quantification of the intraoperative nociception. However, the number of studies are limited. Further studies are required to validate this. For postoperative analgesia, the pupillary reflex diameter parameters have no correlation with the pain. However, the parameters which are based on the pupillary unrest they seems to be promising. The extent of the regional nerve techniques can be reliably predicted by this pupillometry. And in ICU patient, the brainstem function after the cardiac resuscitation and condition that lead to the increase in the intracranial pressures can be correctly identified by the pupillometer. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sukhwanti. A very, very nice talk on pupillometry. And it's amazing that a simple, small handheld device like a pupillometer can give you such a wealth of information. 
I think we all must look into this device and and try to explore its applications to the best uh, possible outcome. So uh, we've got a few questions in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Alpa Sonawana wants to know if CRI monitor is available in India. So to the best of my knowledge, it is not available in, in our country at present, but I'm really excited and looking forward to its availability soon. And she has a question, Dr. Nitin, if you would like to answer that. She wants to know the sensitivity and specificity of uh, CRI. Uh, the sensitivity of CRI is 0 0.91, uh, 0 0.93, and the specificity is 0 0.91. So it's, it has a good high sensitivity and specificity with respect to the uh, use in the resuscitation of the trauma, high, uh, hemorrhagic shock. So, so it has a good sensitivity, a very high sensitivity and specificity. However, in other conditions, I think we still, I mean, a lot has been done with respect to the hemorrhagic shock. Rest other uh, conditions and uh, places where it's been used, I think uh, we still need more uh, validation and uh, larger trials. But for hemorrhagic shock, it has got a very good sensitivity. Yes. And, uh, you know, we are now going into preventive medicine is always the best. So preemptive right. management, I think, is the best way. Uh, I, I do feel it can be a very, very useful tool. Uh, Dr. Mithu Kumar uh, wants, uh, has a question from Dr. Sukhyanti, and the question is that will opioids like morphine affect pupillometry? Uh, yes, uh, the opioids, they definitely affect the pupillometry parameters, but even in the background of these effect of the opioid on the pupil, it has been even then found to be a very good predictor for quantifying the intraoperative nociception. Uh, I have one. I have one question here, and that is for Dr. Lalit Gupta. Dr. Lalit, you've been using Conox quite a bit, and in your opinion, where do you think Conox fails, if it fails at all, or its limitations? The only thing where the Conox fails is that the uh, perforate is dirty, or the electrodes are not sticky properly. This is the only thing where I have seen the Conox fails. Otherwise. We have used in more than 80 patients and every patient in our post visit uh, uh, thesis and, and every patient, it gives the accurate prediction of the post-op So the failure is only when the device, the battery is either switched off or when the electrodes are lost. That is the only thing. If you the electrodes are at present a bit costlier, it's around a few thousand rupees. So if you use it again and again, the sticky goes on. That once it is out of the sticky, then the feelings may out. It's still there. It is very highly specific. The little sticky, the things are less. So until and unless you have used it more than seven, eight times, it will give you the accurate. Right. So I think we had the same problem with the disc monitor also. The sticking of the electrodes was always a struggle. In fact, I remember there was... Uh, most of the time we were you just pressing the electrodes onto the forehead with our hands only trying to get these uh, yeah, or some tape one, like. one more thing it is only measuring the emg and eeg right so it is not measuring any autonomic so we need different inputs to assess nociception if we are thinking about nausea. That is, that is so it has its own limitations also. Sticking electrode is fine, it fails, but it has its own limitations. Conox. Yes, I'm sure every device has its limitation, but still I think uh, we are all in agreement here that it, despite its you know, basic limitations. Yeah, it's one of the good devices. And it is very handy. You can keep it anywhere, you can put it on any port, like on the IV stand, and it works very fine. So, so that's really uh, very interesting uh, inputs from everyone. Uh, I cannot see any more uh, comments in the chat box. It's, it's, I think all the three topics were very unique and new. So probably our, our audience is still absorbing what they have learned today. Um, any other comments from any of the panelists uh, would be most welcome. Very nice talk by all of the speakers, ma'am. I would like to invite Sud ma'am for the word of thanks, I guess. Okay. Um, very truly said, it was an excellent webinar. Hearty, heartiest congratulations to you. You Thank always you. choose 
topics which are out of the box, not out of the box really, but out of the usual uh, schedule or the usual curriculum of the students. And the topics were really very, very uh, new to many of us. And uh, really, we need time to absorb those, <laughs> the topics. And yes. I'd like to but thank two, you. Two small questions that have come up, ma'am. I'm okay. sorry. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, Dr. Alpa would wants to know which is the I, near ideal monitor for nociception monitory from the available one. So, Dr. Prachi, I think you would be the right person to answer that. Yeah, and at the, present, there's the nociceptive objective in uh, levels. NOL monitor, which is the best, which is based on the ANS uh, guidelines. It is an, incorporating AI also in it and takes in four parameters for it to measure the nociception, but it is not available in India at present, annual mm -hmm. monitor. So at present, the, uh, from the available monitor, CONOX, as we have discussed, is one of the best. And, and what is the monitor. cost of CONOX? Dr. Muthu Kumar would like to know what is the cost of CONOX? It is around uh, 4.5 uh, to 5 lakhs somewhere. That, uh, that is the cost of CONOX. Right, right. Uh, sorry, sorry, Dr. Jashi, ma'am, for interrupting you for these two small questions. No, no, it was very important. We must answer the questions. In fact, if there are any more, we don't mind answering them. Uh, so, thank you once again, and thanks, Bharti. You've always uh, <laughs> been a very strong leader, and thank you so much, not only for this webinar, but for all the contributions you have for our ICA. And thank you so much. Dr. Nitin, Dr. Prachi, Dr. Lalit, and Dr. Sukhyanti for those excellent lectures. We've all gained a lot and look forward to the next webinar next Wednesday on the 18th. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Ishtia, for the very well comparing. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, 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 ma thank, ma uh, thank you, ma'am. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye, good night. See you. Good good night. night. Bye, -bye. Bye, dear. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your valuable insights. Thank Hoping you. to be again on this platform very soon with all your next sessions. So with all your permissions, can we conclude the session over here? Yeah. Sure. Thank yeah. you, Ankita, and thank you, Dr. Ishtar. Thank, thank you. Everyone. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone.